Hi, and welcome to the heyday of stock utility outboard racing in Hague. I'm Ginger Henry Kunzel. I'm going to take you back on a little trip back to those days from 1954 to 64 when those brave men and a few women were racing their boats in Hague on Lake George. This big billboard that you see here was right down in the center of Hague, right at the uh, intersection of Route 8 and Route 9N. It went up every year and they changed the date. That little cutout of the 266N on the top, I'm proud to say, was my dad's boat called Gingerly. So the, the Lake George Regatta Association, which was the club that sponsors and conducts the annual Hague Regatta, was one of the oldest clubs in the country. It was originally established as the Hague Rowing Club in the early 1880s. And in 1892, it became the Lake George Regatta Association. It actually conducted the annual Hague Regatta until 1930, after which it became inactive. And the revival of the Hague Regatta began in 1953 when the professional outboard regatta was held with outboard hydroplanes racing on a closed circuit course. In an exhibition heat held during the regatta of 1954, three inboard hydroplanes, all berthed in Hague, raced around the course. Juno, which was owned and driven by Robert E. Henry Jr. of Hague, Chloe, owned by that same Robert E. Henry or, Ju or Bob, and driven by his brother Jack Henry, which was my dad, and Why Not, which was owned and driven by Bill Morgan of Silver Bay. They raced around the course at speeds of up to 90 miles per hour, covering 10 five-mile heats. The Lake George Mirror touted it as the fastest exhibition seen on Lake George since the Gold Cup races, in which George Rice of Bolton Landing participated in 1936. In 1954, a group of Hague residents decided to reconstitute the Lake George Regatta Association, which was the organization originally founded in the 1930s. Um, I'm sorry, originally founded in the 19th century. They had small meetings at the American Legion Hall, and they had a regatta program, and I quote from that, at first planned as a small, more or less local marathon race for the summer of 1955, mushroomed into a major event when the proposed $800 budget was expanded to provide prizes worth $2,500 in 1955 and attracted 62 boats. The next year, there were 109 entries, the largest event in the East, and billed as the vacation marathon run on the most beautiful course in the country. Now here you see some of the people who were either racers or who were involved in organizing the regatta in Hague. So just in case you don't recognize anybody, I'm going to put the names up. Charlie Fitzgerald was uh, one of the more colorful regatta racers. And uh, Bob Hoyt, of course, owned the Hague supermarket and was the fire chief. And he was instrumental. He never drove a boat, but he um, was instrumental in the organization. Bernie Clifton, who you see here, was the publicity chairman. And he was um, the one that I got all of these photos and a lot of the information from in the old regatta programs. Here are some more of the organizers. There on the right is uh, my mother, Dottie Henry. Next to her is Bernie Clifton again. So this is the cover of one of the regatta programs. And uh, this is the start. The start of the race was always off of the Dock and Dine Dock. That's where the starters were and um, a lot of the broadcasters. And the boats would sort of rev up down by the uh, Waltonian Island groups group and uh, come roaring down across the starting line. So what you're seeing here 
is obviously from a boat taken out on the lake um, watching the boats start. The big building that you see there at the left was the old Trout House Hotel. So as I mentioned, in um, 1955 there were 62 boats. The next year there were 109 boats. And by 1957 they had prizes worth $3,500 and 143 entries. The convenient pit facilities, the extra PA system coverage, the communication setup, and varied accommodations available all, along the lake all added up to almost unanimous. The drivers really liked to come to this regatta. Now here again, this is another cover. Um, this shot is a shot down the lake, and um, that is Charlie Fitzgerald in his boat, which was called Havin Fitz. So the excellent communication system set up by the Warren County Sheriff's Department enabled radio calls from various points on the course to come into the local fire truck, which was located at the main pit area. They were relayed to pit crews by an Air Force PA system manned by recruiting personnel. So the pits where the um, mechanics waited for their drivers were in the Hague Park and also all along the shore from Dock and Dine, which is um, kind of in the center of Hague. It's just north of the park. There was the Dock and Dine restaurant, which was the main headquarters for hanging out for the drivers. And um, they had this long dock that went out into the lake. And um, they would re meet there before the races, after the races. So we got a, um, an email from Frank Miser, who's, who's from Hague. And he wrote, thanks for remembering Marcel. Marcel is um, Marcel Raveau, who was a builder of many of the boats that were racing, including the one you see here, Havin Fitz. He had a very special design of the hull. I met Marcel at the Lake George Marathon, and he was one of the first guys to help a 17-year-old kid that thought he knew everything, really start to know everything. He showed me how to read spark plugs, and to use two heat range plugs in my Here you see um, Havin Fitz and Dick Bolton, which is, he's racing a speed, line, speed liner, and Charlie Fitzgerald is racing the um, Revell. Again, this is a cover from the Lake George Regatta. Here you see some of the um, advertisements that uh, were in the regatta program and I find these very interesting some of these well I would say all of these businesses don't exist anymore now that I think about it there used to be a movie theater in Thai which was the state theater you can see what was playing back then um, there was Cook and Sacco which I think a lot of people might remember shopping at Ed Rowe Marine which was down near where the hacker company is now. And of course, Delarm's Dairy, where we all got our milk. These were the pits in the park. This is the park, and over on the right you see what's now the boat launch. And boats would come from pretty much all over the country, and uh, as far away as Michigan, and a lot from Pennsylvania. It was a big weekend in Hague. They'd be out practicing ahead of time, and uh, it was pretty loud. People that are annoyed by the jet skis probably don't remember how loud those racing boats were when they were all here in town. You can see the old cars, see that it was the 50s. Again, this is in the park looking south. See some of the boats. Now these boats, I remember well, my dad was a racer, my older brother was a racer, my younger brother was a racer, and I'll tell you a little bit later about how I was almost a racer. Um, 
But these boats had no reverse or neutral. They only had forward. So basically, um, you had to turn off the engine when you were coming in to land far enough ahead of time so you didn't run up on the beach or into the dock. And when you were starting out, you pulled the engine and you took off. You could not, there wasn't anything slow about these things. Again, this is the, um, what's now the boat launch there and the park. More pictures of the pits in the, in the park. Again, I have all of these photos from um, Bernie Clifton, who was the publicity chair. And I think these pictures were probably, the photos were taken in different years. Um, between uh, 55 and 62, 63. So I just like, um, love looking at these old pictures and these boats. I don't think there are too many. Here you can see the park again. Looks a lot different than it does today. That was the Dock and Dine Dock. And uh, you can kind of see the PA system there. These are more of the um, pits. Now this would be north of the Dock and Dine Dock. And here too, the uh, Tudor style was um, the Dock and Dine and also the um, Trout House Garage were built in that Tudor style. And uh, you can see there were a lot more buildings along the lake there. Again, just um, that would be basically where the uh, Trout House Village Beach is today. And here, this is John Harth, who <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to be able to talk to on the phone. And he said, I ran the Lake George Marathon from 53 to 62 in both Class C and Class D. I won it twice in C class in 58 and 60 and set the class record in 1960 with 2 hours, 15 minutes, and 45 seconds. I cracked the bottom of one of my boats on the hoist on Dick Bolton's boathouse when the rope broke. I still talk to Dick from time to time. Dick's boat was rock and roll baby. I drove the boat called High Mabel. Dick wanted to get me a job at the mill and I sold my boat to Eddie Hutchins who sold it to Charlie Fitzgerald. I camped at Rogers Rock and I did think about moving to Lake George to Hague but just never did it. And then he thanked me a lot for giving him a call. He said it brought back a lot of good memories. And he was really happy. So here <clears throat> you see um, Dick Bolton and Charlie Fitzgerald. Dick Bolton was supervisor of Hague for many years. And uh, he and Charlie were both part of the organizing committee for the regatta. And um, I also talked to him on the phone. He said he raced for about three or four years and uh, he remembers races from Albany to New York City on the Hudson going up to Clayton and the Thousand Islands and um, also he was he was talking about all these races and, and also the races in Wisconsin and he thought well it seemed like a good idea to maybe get it going in Hague. It brought in a lot of people in the hotels for the week and at first they raced on closed courses that were short, but um, more laps. And, uh, but the water was too rough for, for such closed course races. And uh, so they decided to make them longer races. And they were actually 90 mile races. They, I guess they started in Hague. They went down, originally they went down to Sabbath Day Point and then went up to um, Baldwin, Island, Baldwin, I believe. And um, then they shortened the course a little bit. So they went around Scotch Bonnet Island and up to Baldwin where there was a buoy. Um, and originally it was a 22 mile course that they went around four times. And then they shortened the course to 15 miles and went around 
six times, so it's 90 miles. But when they decided to make them a marathon, it wasn't much of a spectator sport anymore, as you can imagine. Um, you, you watch the start, and then they might come back up heading north, and, uh, but they might be out kind of far on the lake. And then when they came back headed south, they had to come in pretty, a little closer to shore because of the, um, you know, they had to be checked at each of these checkpoints to make sure they were going past all the checkpoints. But it wasn't really that interesting because there was a lot of time when you weren't seeing any boats. So, um, and, and Dick Bolton also said that the hotels started complaining because some of their guests really didn't like all that noise and they would stay away. Most of these boat racers didn't really stay in the hotels. A lot of them camped, um, or they didn't, they didn't really have much money, so they were really trying to um, stay in, in less expensive places. So they didn't really help the hotels in Hague. Uh, they didn't really bring much business to that. So, as Dick said, it was a, a detraction rather than a, an attraction for guests. So he had a speed liner boat, and it was called Miss Penny. His, his wife is Penny Bolton, who was postmaster here in Hague for many years. And then he also had a boat called Rock and Roll Baby, which is what you're seeing here. And he was explaining that the Revaux was built for rough water, and the speed liner and another boat called the Sidcraft were lighter weight, and they were better for calmer water. So it really sort of depended on what the water was like. Uh, which boat could do better. So my brother Ed Henry wrote a note about his memories and he said, during my summers growing up on Lake George some of my fondest memories are of the annual Lake George Marathon. Every August the racers would gather on the beaches of Hague, usually starting to arrive early in the week before the race. We would always be anxious to hear the buzz of the engines. The boats would line the beaches extending from the park all the way to today's Trout House Village. The property owners all allowed the boats to set up shop on their beach along the strip. The hotels, now long gone, abuzz with the social events of the race. As a family of, of racers, my father, then brother, and I would have already been out on the lake long before, adjusting the engine, making timing runs for the starting line. We even went as far as to set up markers in front of the house, and we would practice timing the start. I'm sure it was much to the dismay of our neighbors. My best friend Rick Bolton and I would spend hours perusing the pits, looking at the boats, talking to the drivers, and always visiting the question, who would win the race this year? The same names would return year after year, some from as far away as Michigan. We would always have the enduring question, which boat was better, the heavier but more durable Revaux, or the faster, lighter, but also more prone to damage, Speedliner or Sidcraft? Rick always favored the Speedliner, myself the Revaux. Kind of along the lines of my dad's better than your dad or my dad's boat's better than your dad's boat. We learned to judge the class by the sound of the engines. The A, C, and D class with their characteristic two-cycle scream, the 36 class with their quiet Evinrood engines, and the B class with the tuned exhaust that you could hear for miles. I spent the summer practicing and gearing up for the race. The day of the race, there was, of course, the usual strong north wind with monster waves. I remember the waves were so large that I could only get the boat on plane while heading with the wind, but when I would turn the boat around, I would get knocked down again. I eventually succumbed to engine failure and did not finish the race, or was it total fatigue and engine failure was a more fitting story. That year was the last year the marathon was ever run. It was a short career in boat racing, but my memories still last. As a matter of fact, I still have the original Gingerly in my barn in Wyoming. The engine has been restored, the boat needs a lot of work, but someday I hope to again share the noise of the D with others on the lake. My friends will know exactly who it is when they hear it screaming down the lake. So this is Eddie at age 12. Actually, you had to be 12 to race in the A class, which was the smallest boat. And um, so the year he turned 12 was the last year they held the, the marathon. 
I actually not even sure that this is the year he raced. He he looks to me like he's even younger. And I often wonder, I, I don't think I would have let my kids go out in a boat like that when they were 12 or race a, um, a 90 mile marathon in one of these things, which you really just have plywood between you and the, and the lake. The lake always seemed to be have its roughest day on the day at these marathons. They were always in August. It was often a north wind, just really, really rough. You can see that one boat right off the dock that is right up in the air. When you think about it, the driver was in the back. There was no weight up front. These are very pretty lightweight boats. And um, so with the driver and the motor in the back, it, it actually took a while to get them on plane. And then if they would hit a wave, they would often go right up in the air with their nose and and they could flip pretty easily this is um, what is now the trout house dock I also talked to Craig DeWald who started racing when he was 12 in 1953 and uh, he explained to me that Kikafer who uh, was an engine builder was backing the marathons to promote his engines what made the marathon successful was we were the only show in town. Nobody had jet skis or big fancy boats. When I asked him about Lake George, he said several things stick in my mind. The clean water, the nice course. You go to see the beautiful different parts of the country. He would travel around the country with his dad in the summers and race. He said Michigan was flat, but the scenery at Lake George was beautiful. And he remembers meeting Marcel Raveau at a race. And Marcel was looking for a driver to promote his Raveau boats. And uh, he picked Craig because he was a nice young kid who was really interested in racing and was doing pretty well. And uh, he said, those were some of the best years of my life. Here's some more answers and timekeepers. That man with the camera there is uh, Walt Grishkot, which a lot of you might That's the rising house up on the hill. So again, this is the start. Most years, um, all the classes would start together. So you could have 140 boats all starting at once. And uh, some years they tried starting different classes at different times. Again, the start and uh, what was the Trout House Hotel there in the back. The, uh, way over on the right, you see one of the buoys that um, that was a checkpoint. Now this picture is Marion Grimes, and she's in um, a D-class boat, which um, she's uh, practicing. This is actually my father's boat, and um, it was... It was uh, a year that he was not able to race because um, he actually had appendicitis that year. And um, so in the Post Star, it said about Marion Grimes, she was actually the first woman to race in the boat. For the first time, a member of the so-called weaker sex will attempt to compete in the fast DU runabout owned by Charlie Fitzgerald. So um, although she... She practiced in my dad's boat. She actually raced Charlie Fitzgerald's boat. And uh, I, I remember when I was a kid that Marion was my idol who was because she was the only woman who raced. I had always heard that she raced and then went into the convent right after that. I got her phone number and I called her up recently. She told me that the organizer said they'd give prize money to any woman who finished. She was 21 at the time, and she just went out and practiced three or four times. She said she wasn't scared at all, but she said my father was horrified. He said, God damn it, I'll give you the $100 if you just pull out of the race. And um, But she wasn't going to do that. And she said she was going great guns in the race, but then the pulley for the steering cable pulled out from the side of the boat. And she was trying to fix it with her screwdriver, but it was one of those really rough years. And uh, she finally had to 
give up and she drifted into uh, Arkady Bay and somebody towed her back but um, she didn't know that they had actually called off the race so she um, she actually got the uh, prize money because even though she didn't finish because they'd ended the race she got it anyway So here's somebody being towed in. Uh, my older brother, Johnny Henry, said, My father was big on racing outboards from the 30s through the early 60s, and from the late 40s on, his boats were always Ravaux's. Marcel Ravaux and my dad were buddies. He came and stayed with us a couple times when I was 11 or 12, and I do remember him. In 1957, my dad bought me a Class A Ravaux. I was nine at the time. He wouldn't put a racing motor on it, but he put a five horsepower Evinrude, which was enough to get speeds of up to about 20 miles per hour. I had a lot of fun booming around Lake George on it. And when I was 12, he got me a Mercury seven and a half horsepower racing motor. This particular boat had set the Class AU record for the measured mile at about 50 miles per hour in 1957, shortly before my father bought it for me. It was, in the words of Neville Shute, little more than a tea tray with an engine on it, and I had every bit as much fun with it as Neville's hero and heroine did. Uh, when I was doing my research, I uh, came across a, a publicity blurb for a, a caption that was written and it made me proud. So it said, uh, the, the third place winner in this year's race was John T. Henry, which is my dad, government analyst of Falls Church, Virginia in Hague, New York, one of the reorganizers of Lake George Regatta Association, loosening his life jacket while drifting to the pier following the 88 mile race. Henry, Beaten by one and a half minutes, performed an outstanding act of sportsmanship, losing nearly three minutes, when on the first 22-mile lap and in contending position, he stopped to pick up Walt Werner Jr. of Valley Stream, Long Island, and returned him to his own racing boat, which had continued to circle slowly after tossing Werner into the rough water. Passed by about ten boats during the rescue operation, Henry returned to the grind and gradually regained much of his lost time although the race ran out on him before he could seriously menace the first two finishers. So that was quite, sort of one of the marks that I heard from a lot of the, uh, one of the hallmarks that I heard from a lot of the racers was that it really was, um, yes, they wanted to win, but they, they also, they had a camaraderie and they, they really would help each other out. In um, 1958, 16 boats had entered the race. There were two and three foot rollers search, searching down the lake, driven by a south wind that at times reached velocities in excess of 30 miles per hour. Many boats, particularly the A's and B's, were unable to get on plane and they swamped before they could even reach the starting line. Only eight boats actually completed the full, full four laps of the course. Now remember, there were 116 entered eight boats finished. Six additional boats were flagged off the course because of approaching darkness and given finished credits and prizes. That was the year Marion Grimes was racing. The rough water was indirectly responsible for two driver injuries. Charles Jones driving a DU had fuel line trouble and shifted the line from one tank to the other. He attempted to get underway again, but the pounding his boat had taken apparently caused a gasoline leak and his boat burst into flames when he restarted his engine, causing first and second degree burns to his face, hands, and forearms. His boat was burned to the waterline and sank in deep water, a total loss. Boats of this type cost approximately $1,200 fully equipped back then. John Muha was rushed to Moses Ludington Hospital, suffering from shock after he was flagged off the course and awarded third place in the BU class. That's the way the newspaper article was worded. I'm not really sure if the shock was from having placed third or probably from something else. Local drivers, Marion Grimes was flagged off the course after the third lap. Dean Cook completed one lap, but the rivets broke and opened a crack in his boat and Gary Boyd tore the transom from his boat. 
This picture here is, um, again, you can see the 266N, which was my dad's boat, and uh, they're going around a buoy, and <laughs> this B boat actually is um, coming down on the throttle of my dad's boat. The throttle is on the left. As you can see, this guy is holding his throttle. These were called dead man's throttles, and if you did get thrown out of your boat, um, you know, you would let go of the throttle and the boat would stop. There, there was actually a little button you could push that if you wanted to take your hand off the throttle and rest it, you could do that and it would lock the throttle, but it wasn't really advised to do that because if you, if you got thrown out of your boat, which did happen, your boat would just keep on going. These are some more pictures of the race. So in 1957, there were 123 entries and only 49 finished. The rough water cost, caused about 45 flips, but no serious injuries. One of the flips was by John Harth, who I mentioned earlier in this presentation, but he flipped actually after he crossed the finish line. As he apparently relaxed and turned his boat toward the pit, that's when his craft flipped. In 1959, John Johnson of Kenosha, Wisconsin, flipped after leading the first three laps in his DU boat when he hit away from a pleasure boat. He was admitted to Moses Ludington, suffering cuts on his hands. And in 1961, a driver hit a piling at Baldwin Dock and was thrown clear before his boat went on under the dock and was demolished. So he must have locked his uh, dead man's throttle. I like, I like this newspaper clipping. The U.S. postmaster in Hague, New York, will carry the colors of that little town in one of the country's top outboard racing events of the year. Charles F. Fitzgerald, the only U.S. postmaster participating in outboard marathon racing, will compete. <laughs> Guy's getting the checkered flag. This is um, Lou Brock, as some of you might remember, one of the officials on the race committee. And here they are inspecting the boats. They definitely had to inspect the boats each time, and some were disqualified if they had done things to their boat that they weren't supposed to. So there, there you see the throttle pretty, pretty well. And there you can see the motor. So they had good trophies. This was the Post Star Trophy, and it was awarded to the top finisher from Warren, Washington, or Saratoga County area. There was the Lewis Wheeler Sterling Trophy for Outstanding Speed Performance and the Thai Motors Sterling Tray to the winner of the class having the greatest number of entries. There was the Richard J. Bolton Memorial Trophy to the top finisher from the local sponsoring club. And there were Revere Silver Bowls that went to the first three finishers in each class, plus merchandise awards such as Mercury Outboard Motors, Waltham Watches, Binoculars, Stopwatches, Appliances. In 1957, I read that there was a $10 cash award that would go to the class leaders who were ahead at the end of each of the four 22-mile laps. An innovation in boat racing and one designed to increase speeds during the early stages of the race. So the uh, trophies and the prizes were on display and um, so the public could see them at the race headquarters in uh, the Ray, Ray Laundrie's building on Route 9N. Here, uh, Bernie Clifton is awarding Ray Laundrie the post start. This is the trophy. This is, uh, one year they had a pleasure craft race and um, my mother in the pink lady, for some reason this photograph also turned pink, she raced with Gloria Singer in the pleasure craft. And, and in uh, one year, I was actually going to race too. And uh, unfortunately, something happened to the boat 
got a, developed a crack in it, and so I had to uh, scratch. But it, I did get a lot of nice publicity. That was pretty. It's pretty fun having that um, newspaper clipping. So here you see some of the people of Hague that were in the patrol boats. It's kind of fun to see a lot of these old names. And um, that year they actually had a queen and her attendants. Every year, not every year, but a lot of years they would have uh, activities in conjunction with the regatta. So now I'm going to show you a lot of photos of um, some of the racers and um, just enjoy the music and, and watching these guys and um, take a look at some of the names of the boats. I think they're, they're pretty funny. Jackets and each gun begins to do. 